Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to this live program. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Ajit Apuhami from Sri Lanka. Dr. Apuhami completed his undergraduation from Sri Lanka and then moved on to the UK, where he completed his higher surgical training, including the FRCS trauma and orthopedics, as well as the EBOT exam. If you've noticed, Dr. Apuhami has lectured on our channel several times, and today he's going to discuss about cerebral palsy for the FRC trauma in orthopedics. So today it's my great honor to bring back Dr. Ajit Apuhami for this fantastic live program. Over to you, Ajit. Thank you very much, Hitesh. Good evening, everybody. So <clears throat> uh, today I'm going to discuss about cerebral palsy. Actually, it's not a very hot topic for the FRC exam, but you need to know that. If you're going for the FRCS exam, you need to do it because it's, it's often, very often, frequently questioned in the MCQ paper. Sometimes it could be a you know, short case or intermediate case, probably not a long case. So if you know the facts, and sometimes it's a common location in the viva table, especially in the pediatric viva table, they will go show some pictures and ask so many things under this topic. It is uh, the range of uh, facts is very uh, not demarcated, but it's a vast topic. It's it's a actually it's a very big topic. But under FRCS, I will I will uh, going to uh, give a very summary of the picture of the under cerebral palsy. What you need to know before the FRCS exam under this lecture. So if you move in with the definition wise, so we'll start with it's a. It's a permanent and non-progressive motor disorder or into the brain damage from birth or during the first two years. This, that's very important that the time frame because it's a before birth and after birth, after two years, if something happened to the brain, so we can, it, it's possible to develop cerebral palsy. It's basically, it's developed a upper motor nerve palsy. It's commonly involved. Literally, it's uh, literally this lesion is uh, static, yet its clinical picture is quite progressive. That's why it's a disease, it's a kind of a spectrum of the disease. If you discuss at the point, it, it, it has a vast range because of its clinical progressive picture. When you talk about the incidence, it's about two in 2,000 uh, incident rate is there. So there's a few pictures. So when you talk about the etiology, there are two thirds, uh, sorry, uh, one third of cases, there is no, uh, there is no exact cause. But rest of the causes, because of the time frame, what I discussed, they have categorized the causes prenatal, perinatal and the postnatal. This prenatal causes, these are the, uh, this is uh, this etiological uh, component would be a frequent location in your MCQ paper. Make sure, because I have highlighted few areas you need to know, because they frequently ask in your MCQ paper. When you come to the prenatal, that means before birth, it's commonly the, the uh, placental insufficiency, bleeding, and smoking habits, alcohol habits, and the infections, mainly in the torch, that means toxoplasmosis, rubella, cytomegalovirus, and herpes simplex type 2. When you go to perinatal, the prematur is the most common type, except uh, in addition to that, anoxic injuries, again, infection, chronic terrors, and multiple birth traumas, and placental abruption. When you come to the postnatal, that means two years after delivery, it's mainly infection, then probably it's a head injury also, head trauma can cause cerebral palsy. This type of classification, this is a very important area and the frequent location in the viva table, there are three main classifications we need to discuss about. Friendly is a physiology, then anatomy, then gross motor function classification uh, system and the, the later one is a Hoffer classification. That you, didn't, you don't have to know about main detail about the Hoffer classification, but this I have highlighted clearly the gross motor function classification system is a very, very important thing. The frequent location in your MCQ paper and frequently asked in your viva table. So you need to know in detail all types of uh, types or types under gross motor function classification system. And you need to know how to identify that each type because that's very important. If it's a short case or intermediate case, they might ask 
okay tell me what, under which category you put this patient so you need to know these are the things i'm looking so i will explain one by one when you go into that classification system so if i wave into the physiological classification first so it's main three four types so the one first is a spastic spastic is mainly is damage to the pyramidal system is a pyramidal that's the commonest type of uh, physiological presentations of cerebral palsy is the spastic so it's quite common it's nearly 80% comes to spastic patient due to damage of pyramidal then dyskinesis that mean athetoid that's due to extra pyramidal lesions basal ganglia that it also has a wide range of uh, presentation balismus goria rigid and dystonia then uh, ataxic ataxis again is extra pyramidal it's involved in the cerebellum and the brain stem region they lose the balance when you come to the grossly uh, pyramidal and extra pyramidal both in norma they will present as a mixed picture of the uh, this combinations of spastic and atetosis this is a physiological classification that spastic dyskinetic and ataxic then anatomical classification this anatomical classification we divide amount uh, the area involvement where there is a one limb involvement we call that monoplegic if the one side involvement hemiplegic diplegic and tetraplegic or three involvement is uh, triplegic so this diplegic quadriplegic and the mono, uh, hemiplegic is quite common so now we are coming to the most vital area that the gross motor function classification system why this functional system uh, this classification system is quite important it it has a very predictive for the hip subluxation because hip subluxation is a very important orthopedic complication uh, we can see in the cerebral ball, cerebral palsy patient so because this gross motor uh, gross motor functional classification system has a very uh, good very close correlation with this hip subluxation so we can classify type 1 type 2 type 3 type 4 type 5 so i will tell exactly how do you identify in your this classification system i'll tell how i remembered how try to i try to memorize this classification system when i was studying so i'll start from the backwards to on uh, uh, from back to forwards so i'll start with the type 5 in the type 5 patient type 4 and type 5 patient usually they are wheelchair bound usually they are wheelchair bound the very important thing if you see a patient if patient is wheelchair bound they can they can do a very independent mobility then we have to look for the head stability they can't keep the head straight so it always classified as type level type 5 then people who are wheelchair bound they can keep their head straight by their own so they we can classify this type 4 so that's how we differentiate type 5 and type 4 then we go into the <clears throat> uh type 3 type 3 is they can't walk without the assistant devices either walking frame or wheelchair or so stick support or whatever they always need a assistant device to mobilize inside and outside so we classified but rest of the all they are really good and their head control good their mobility is everything but still they need a assistance with the devices so that is type 3 then type 1 and type 2 when you go to the type 1 is they are perfectly inside and outside they are completely independent but they have become a little bit compromised when they perform the gross motor functions very advanced functions they they become very compromised but <clears throat> type 2 it is uh, again independent mobility but when they go to outside the house community based their mobility they are a little bit compromised that's the way i remember this classification system so i hope that uh, it's up to you to decide so people have different different uh, methods of memorizing so that's how i start from backwards because head uh, head support is quite very important when you assess in the cerebral palsy patient so that's why i always start from type 5 then type 4 then i'll go backwards to uh, type 1 uh, that's how i memorized you can apply whatever the suitable for you 
So when you go to the Hoffa classification, that is based again the, according to the ambulatory status. The grade one people who can do the community ambulation, the grade two is a household ambulation. Get the again this uh, with the support of the assistant devices is a th therapeutic ambulation, and people are non-ambulatory classified as type four. Okay. When you talk about the spectrum of the disease, the natural history of the disease is always, as I said at the beginning, it's a kind of uh, upper motor lesion. It's always very common, it's a spastic lesion. So they presented with the spastic disease. So if it's a prolonged spastic, what happens is the prolonged contractions of the muscle, muscles become very short and then they develop into contractures. These contractures, again, you start with the dynamic contraction, then it's going to fix contraction with the Contraction then it leads to deformities and subluxation, and later on, where the patients are non-ambulatory, then what happens? The bone quality, the mineral density goes off, and there's a possibility of trivial fractures. So at the latter, when you talk about the prognosis, I right, the spectrum of the disease, it's more reliable to predict of the ability of walking. <clears throat> Walk is independent, is uh, independent sitting by age two years. There are more possibility. It's a very reliable predictor for ability to walk. So that's why we always, when you get the small children as a, a short case or intermediate case, we are, or we always ask from the mother at which age child start to sit independently. At which age child start to stand with the support. So those are very predictive uh, elements we can assess about his future independence. So when you talk about the evaluations of the cerebral palsy, as I said, it's a spectrum of disease. It's a plethora of problems. It's not a single problem. So it basically we have to approach this as a multidisciplinary approach. Not only orthopedic surgeons, a lot of pediatricians, neurologists, sometimes they are associated with a lot of epilepsy, motor sensory cognitive problems, speech problems, hearing defects, visual impairments, feeding defects, learning and behavioral problems, rather than anything else. We need to address about the psychological support, especially for the caregivers, especially for the parents, because they are they are basically mentally compromised, looking after this kind of uh, you know functionally this uh, compromised child. So you imagine, so we they need a very it's uh, what I feel it's very vital to give them adequate psychological support to keep they uh, to prepare their mind to be the constant or persistent support to that child to be, uh, become independent. So when you talk, about, uh, when you waving into orthopedic evaluation, so I will talk about the persistence of uh, <laughs> primitive reflexes. That's a very <clears throat> common area of the question in the MCQ paper because usually we all know that reflexes is a primitive reflexes. All normal, healthy infants they come up with reflexes. There are primitive reflexes, but they disappear when they develop, when they grow up, then they start myelination of the neurons. They gradually dissolve, they uh, gradually disappear their primitive reflexes at the different stages, four months, six months, like that. Usually, these primitive re reflexes me usually mediated by extrapyramidal system. What happened when the brain start myelination further and further, then development of the pyramidal system, they gradually primitive system, primitive reflexes disappear. But in a cerebral palsy children, they are they, they affect this. Uh, Primitive system is grossly affected. They they tend to uh, persist their primitive reflexes. That is uh, usually that shows is the people who have in the primitive reflexes persistent primitive reflexes. They are usually non-ambulatory. That's the one thing we need to remember in the MCP paper and the small child even in the short case. Then you have to look for the primitive reflexes. And the other skeletal issues we need to see in under orthopedic evaluation, spasticity and their voluntary movements, their weakness, how their coordination and the sensory impairment. When you uh, <clears throat> when you, when I talk about spasticity, as I said you before, it's spasticity we can classify it against the spectrum. We start with the dynamic contractors because. Spas they prolong spasticity, the muscle become contracted and get shortened, then muscle develop fibrosis, then they they hesitate to contract further. So what happens? They increase the tone and they become very deformed features. But when you come to the dynamic stage, it's uh, that we can deformity, we can easily overcome during examination. But when you turn into if it is persistent that dynamic con uh, contraction, then it's getting to the fixed contraction. 
that means again is a persistent passive and contracted we cannot overcome with examination they will, they develop a fixed deformity then what happened is a persistent fixed deformity is that leads to joint deformation joint subluxation and dislocation and the secondary bone changes this is a diagram i wanted to explain you because it's a it's a diagram i i made my hand so there is a r1 r2 what r1 is a range range of motions we can classify range r1 and r2 so r1 mean is the amount of movement actively we can make now imagine patient is lying down we try to abduct so when you abduct in we feel the first catch that is r1 so we do further beyond that catch we feel some catchy phase so we have to stop here this bit resistant so we are doing further that is r2 range so this is the range between r1 and r2 is much more bigger it's more different that means this muscle is in the spasticity stage between the r1 and r2 difference is very minimal it's, it's almost same that means muscles are the contractility stage because that is a very important thing that's the area they can question in a viva table how do you know this muscle is in the spasticity or it's in the contract if you can draw with this simple diagram and talk about this r1 and r2 difference i think you can impress the examiner very easily then common sites in all in the central palsy is mainly we talk about the spinal deformities and uh, hip joint as you said is a subluxation and dislocation then the flexion deformity of the knee foot and ankle deformities and the upper limb deformities the spine is a more common uh, common deformity developed in the cerebral palsy is scoliosis overall incidence nearly 20% and it's very uh, high risk category is spastic and quadriplegic patients because usually spastic and quadriplegic patients are it's definitely uh, not independent so they are basically bedridden so there's a high possibility of getting scoliosis the it, that incidence rate is approach up to 100% and this spine uh, deformities may be associated with pelvic tilt or may not associated with pelvic tilt so okay, there is a classification system i don't think you need to know by name this classification winstein classification the code of winstein classification is divided in type 1 and type 2 type 1 is people who can ambulators they have the very double curves very small curves in the thoracic lumbar region but there's no involvement to the pelvic tilt but in the type 2 those are non ambulators they have large curvature in the lumbar and thoracic lumbar region but they have a marked pelvic obliquity i don't think you need to know in detail that kind of a uh, uh, detail about scoliosis and cerebral palsy but i want to if you know this this uh, uh, gross fact about cerebral palsy plus if you can identify that's another possible area they can ask how do you differentiate this they will show the pair extra of the cerebral palsy scoliosis and they say give for this scoliosis and what do you how can differentiate this scoliosis it is associated with cerebral palsy and with this idiopathic scoliosis that's a possible question to be asked so you need to i think you need to refer by your own and study some facts about that how to differentiate that to scoliosis cerebral scoliosis from idiopathic scoliosis okay then um, hip subluxation or dislocation that's a very vital area you need to know so if you talk about hip subluxation you need to know about the remers index that's the frequently question in the mcq paper because uh, if you can't abduct less than if you can abduct less than 55 degrees and uh, looking at the anteroposterior view of the pelvic x ray the head is uh, more than 30% uncovered and the remers index remers index mean when we draw this x ray this horizontal line we call hillgreens line and the outer margins of the acetabulum is the perkins line so if you draw this line the gross that complete diameter of the head and the amount of uh, distance it's out of the perkins line the percentage between this a and b into 100 that is the remus uh, index so it is very uh, 
why uh, very important and it, because it has a more associated with this remus index shows very accuracy of the future subluxation so remus index is less than 33% that hip is quite risk at risk for the subluxation but the remus index is more than 33 so it is uh, basically we consider it as a subluxed hip and when it is dislocated here i'll show you dislocated hip is completely out so remus index is more than 100% it's completely out so then uh, what is the other possibility is uh, other uh, spectrum is a uh, windswept hips windswept hips is uh, the one side is adducted and other side is adducted that happens is adducted side is adductor contraction they adduct the uh, that side and the contralateral side is the abductors are contracted and that keeps in the abducted position that is called windswept deformity Okay, what are the, uh, then we go into the knees. So knees is a commonly is a fixed flexion deformity of the knees due to hamstring spasticity. So very important thing you need to remember when you're correcting the procedure of the hamstring release, lengthening the hamstring to reduce this fixed flexion deformity of the hip, you always remember, need to remember core spasticity of the cartilage. Because if you keep the knee flex position for a long period due to spasticity of the hamstring, and equally, the front muscles, the quadriceps, also keep on stretching, and this is the spasticity for the longer period. They develop core spasticity. Now, even though we reduce, we correct the deformity of the knee by releasing hamstring, but the persistence of this core spasticity of the quadriceps, they will not accomplish their uh, desired function. So, it's always remember when you are releasing in the hamstring, then you always you to release to a certain extent quadriceps release as that's very vital thing and another thing is that could be question in your viva table if you give the fixed section knees and how do you correct then if you mention this core spasticity of the quadriceps then examiner will understand this is some sensible person he has some broad idea about this uh disease then popliteal angle so that is the popliteal angle we measure we flex the hip and then we'll measure the angle between the vertical and this uh, maximum uh, extended position. So that is called popliteal angle. So we measure the popliteal angle in the knees. And then other thing is uh, due to flexion deformities of the hips and knees, they get the spastic crouch contact contractures. So this is basically due to flexion, uh, flexions of hips and flexions of knees and ankle dorsiflexion. So this, uh, you, you can see here that the, the person is a bit of a partially, uh, you know, that is called crouching position. So when they're walking also, they with this uh, same uh, type of walk. So there are different type of walking patterns. We identify in the cerebral palsy. This is the pattern I discussed with the crouch gait. Then could be the equinus, something jumping gait, then true equinus. So, <clears throat> but, I want to emphasize, I really doubt whether you need to know in that detail in your FRCS exam. Because I understand the normal, visual, uh, normal, what you call that, or the uh, general uh, basic science survival table, you need to know about all components about gait mechanism. But I really, really doubt whether they will ask in detail about the, this abnormal gaiting system. They will ask some MCQ points and the crouching gait, what is the position and those things. But um, I really doubt whether you need to know that detail, but I will touch this, this uh, very superficial touch uh, to the sake of completion of my talk. Okay, then what are the uh, uh, possible uh, deformities we can see in the foot and ankle? So as I said, it's equinus and equinovarus and equinovalgus. This again is related to the spasticity. Equinus probably is the triceps to uh, contraction. Econovarus due to tibialis posterior spasticity and econovalgus is the spasticity of perineal muscle. So when you go into the upper limb, usually uh, it's very important. Sometimes they give the uh, short case or sometimes the intermediate case, they will give the patient with the cerebral palsy. They will ask, okay, tell me what are the clinical findings? So if you can explain what you can see, the shoulder internally rotated, is a cerebral palsy. This is a typical picture. We can see the shoulder is internally rotated and forearm is pronated with elbow flexion, wrist flexion, and thumb is in the palm deformities and fingers are in the flex deformities. If you can uh, 
explain this quietly. This is a typical picture of the cerebral palsy child. It's keeping the hand is extended and turned rotate. The person is a flex position with this scissoring gait. So if you can explain this, this is findings you can see. So you need to master it before the exams because you will not got you will not get those things spontaneously at the at the time of exam. So you need to practice these terms so then you can easily score very well in your short cases. So a general examination part because as an orthopedic uh, exam, so you need to know what are the important thing in the aspect uh, in the uh, view of orthopedic point of view. So. So in the general examination, you need to know when you get a patient, you need to know, okay, tell, okay, patient is, there is a wheelchair, there are walking aids, there are some uh, communication devices, sometimes they are using hearing aids. So mention everything you can see in this, uh, in that patient, and there are some orthosis. Sometimes the people, uh, I can, I, I have my personal experience because I got one patient, but he, I really doubt whether it's a cerebral palsy. It's not a cerebral, but he, there was an orthosis the patient has been using, but it was removed and it was kept somewhere adjacent to the uh, patient's bed. So luckily I noticed that if you don't mention, that's very important. You have to keep your eyes widely open when you examine the patient. So keep uh, look surrounding and mention what you can see everything. Because sometimes it's a very important fact. If you meet the patient, uh, the examiner will get a little bit... Uh, annoyed yeah. that you you missed a very important uh, uh, thing so those are very uh, tiny tiny tricky things you need to be very alert because in the exam setup it's a kind of a competitive and it's very important so you need to look at the uh, make sure that you will expose the patient because sometimes in the trunk for the gastrostomy subcutaneous reservoirs for the uh, baclofen pump because muscle relaxant there's a baclofen pump you can see if you keep the clothes Patients is very uh, close, so we might miss it. And look for the head control. It's very, very important because if patient has no head control, I don't, we know that patient is definitely better than patient and wheelchair bound patient. So, and next thing is <clears throat> look for the uh, pattern of involvement, whether it's a, uh, uh, monoplegic, diplegic, or diplegic. So, looking at this, you can uh, mention about this. And very important thing, if you get a patient, child for the exam, always talk to the mother. Always talk to the mother and say, ask whether the child can walk. Sometimes we, we, they will keep the cerebral palsy child on the bed and keep, and the mother, mother is next to him. Then if you ask him to walk, if you don't ask from mother, we don't know whether the child can walk or not. So we do more harm if we, try, if we ask the patient to walk, child can't understand. If try, child jumps from the bed and something happens, it's a disaster. So always talk to them and ask whether the child can stand up, whether the child can get down from the bed and start talking to mother and get some little bit detail because it will be helpful for your rest of your examination finding. Because it's very important to judge whether the patient is ambulatory or non-ambulatory because that, that make a huge, vast difference of your management plan. And describe the body position. As I said, it's the upper limb involvement, how it is internal rotated, elbow extension, the flex of the wrist and fingers and thumb in the hand. Tell everything as a flow. So it's very easy and it's very impressive. And when you go into the it's ambulatory, then talk, uh, if patient is ambulatory, then it's very important. You have to assess. You always ask the patient to walk and assess his gait pattern. What is, how is the normal gait pattern? How is swing his hand? He needs strength. Is a symmetrical gait? And look at the feet, look at the knees, look at his hips, and look at his rotational profiles, everything. Look at his pelvis, it's a tilting or with his levels, and look at his trunk, and look at his, his low doses and scoliosis, everything look. <clears throat> These are the couple of gait patterns. So this is the toe walking sign. So hip examination, you can then ask the patient to gross examination and then ask the patient to walk. Then you can ask, okay, can you get into the bed and look? Because hip examination, even though I understand it's not a easy, it's, it's sometimes it's a daunting task to do in the proper hip examination in the cerebral palsy patient rather than doing a normal patient. So at least you need to offer to the examiner. So I'm happy to do the hip examination. Then if the examiner doesn't like, so if I say, okay, don't worry about the hip, because show that hip examination is very vital because hip subluxation contractility and the spasticity we need to assess because that is very important to the mod, uh, mobility of the patient. So by asking that question, by offering the hip examination, 
the examiner will stick that mark you are concerned about the hip of the cerebral palsy child that's that's very important so even though you do not examine so so you can examine the abduction adduction internal rotation external rotation as i said r1 and r2 you can assess separately on the special test you can do the thomas test to do the hip flexion defer fixed flexion deformity i'm not going to do i'm not going to talk here how to do that examination you can go go to the internet and go to the youtube and say thomas test accurate technique because people have different different techniques but what i tell you that stick for one technique because sometimes if you work under two three consultants they have different uh, methods so whatever method stick for one method in your exam because you can't do couple of methods in front of exam so if you are doing the thomas test stick for one thing and then uh, abductor contractures obers stress duncan elite test so this all for the assumption of contraction then knee joint examination again as i said is a we can do the patella position inspection and this range of movements and we can assess the popliteal angle then foot 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 and ankle examination very important thing you need to need the deformity you need to assess a tight achilles tight achilles tendon very important thing don't do not forget do not forget to do the silver skull test it is very very important because because i know that in the foot examiners all as examiners are keeping their eyes widely open like eagles to see whether uh, whether uh, candidate will forget the silver skull test because it's a very vital test because that will change the whole management plan so don't forget i'm not going to tell what is silver skull test here that is to the uh, quadriceps muscle tightening because we are check the soleus in the full extended position then we flex again and do the dorsal flexion again if it is the same range or if it is further so we can assess with the contraction is only the soleus or it's involving the gastrocnemius so it, that decision is very very important so we need to do the silver skull test then when you go into the management plan when you talk about the management plan it's always it's always multidisciplinary approach our target our goal of uh, management is accomplish or achieve ambulation if there is a patient is non ambulatory or if there is a patient is ambulatory get the functional achievement if the patient is non ambulatory so we have to go get at least basic hygiene procedures that is try to make your patient ambulate or try to make patient independent if patient is ambulatory and cut uh, to a certain extent is independent then we need to do our management to focus to improve his functional ability so it it even the goal is also varies from person to person according to his clinical fit and his uh, um, functional status so if it is a dynamic contracture so we have to go for a physiotherapy stretching exercise casting orthoses and we can use some dorsal sinotomy and we can intramuscular botulinum injection for the muscle relaxation and intrathecal back to front and it's a flex flexion deformity now imagine there is no uh, it's a fix right? we can't its facility is gone so we can extend we can do the function then it is fixed then it's a principle is a single evil multiple level surgery that is the key thing you need to remember because birthday surgeries are now out of stand it's we need to avoid birthday surgeries we have to go for a single even multiple level surgeries what we can we can do the tendon release tendon lengthening muscle transfer slipping tendon transfer and bony procedures when you go to scoliosis now we'll take one by one scoliosis you need to know this is a custom molded seat we can insert to allow the better positioning but it will not that evidence says it doesn't give any prevention for the curve progression in the bracing bracing also it's a little bit controversial because bracing would be helpful to improve the sitting balance but it doesn't affect for the corrections of the curve so bracing is also for the cerebral palsy it's quite controversial it's a type 1 that means uh, 
small curvatures without pelvic we can go for a posterior fusion that is for the mobility type 2 we need the posterior and anterior both fusion with the <coughs> we can extend our fixation up to the pelvis because to correct the pelvic shape i don't think you need to know in that detail but i'm just touching this area as for sake of completion when you come to the hip subluxation according to the nice guideline we initially because usually the cerebral palsy that symptoms they come become more dominant after one or two years so we usually perform pelvic x-ray at the age of three years then after that we have to screen annually the target the three main categories of the management of this hip, lux, hip subluxation initially we go for a preventive procedure this preventive procedure means that to uh, slow down hip subluxation the preventive procedures we always go for the soft tissue procedures like tendon release uh adductor release uh swash tendon release that's all for preventive procedures the target is to slow down of hip subluxation then second stage is a reconstructive procedure reconstructive procedure is it's a sublux hip then we have to go for bony procedures plus soft tissue procedures the bony procedures we have to go for D rotation, various D rotation, osteotomy in the proximal humerus, plus or minus pelvic osteotomy. Target is the, to maintain the congruency of the hip joint. I don't think you need to know that surgical procedure. What you have to do? So you have to tell this. We have to go preventive measures as the soft tissue measures. Preventive measures initially. Target is to slow down of subluxation. Then we can go for a constructive measures that soft tissues and bony procedures. Target is to maintain the congruency. At the last step is a salvage procedure. If the hip is completely out, this kind of X-ray, this kind of a patient, okay. yes, this kind of a patient, we can go for any uh, procedure. So we have to go for a salvage procedure. Salvage procedures could be a, uh, wait, a salvage procedures. Could be proximal femoral resections. So I discussed this already. Hip batteries, we do the soft tissue and injection. Then sublux, we do osteotomies. Yes, I discussed that. Then Vincep again, it's adduct adducted hip. We have to release adductors. If it is abducted, we have to release abductors. And then once you correct, then we can combine with bony procedure. It's where this is again like. It's fine. You need to know about spastic hip from dysplastic hip. How to differentiate? Because usually this dysplastic hip is abnormal from the beginning, so we can be recognized within first year. But spastic cerebral palsy hip usually initially it's normal. Once it's spastic and then develop contracted, then it's a subsequential uh, it's a sequential development of this uh, subluxation. <coughs> usually it's recognized after two years. So usually it's a radiological diagnosis, spastic, but dysplastic, we can do the Ottolani and Barlow's physical examination. Initially we can assess. And we can do the ultrasound scan initially. Later we do the after one year x-rays. And causative factors for the spastic mainly it is the muscle spasticity. But dysplastic if it is multifactorial, DTH. So it is mechanical, hormonal, and social factors. Then in subluxation, again, in capacity, it's progressive subluxation. But uh, there is no uh, uh, such a progressive in uh, dysplastic hip. So it is dysplastic, dysplastic. When the acetabular deficiency, usually it's uh, deficient in the postural superior, but usually in the dysplastic, it's usually anterior deficient. So this kind of a uh, couple of differences, because that can be questioned in your viva table and the MCQ paper. How do you differentiate during the X-ray in the pediatric viva? How do you differentiate whether this is dysplastic or it's a spastic hip? So if you know this is fast, then you can nicely argue, counter argue. So as I said before, when you're releasing contractures, uh, we have to release hamstring release. And we have to think about course passivity of the cardiacs. We have to release that as well. Then foot correction, we can go the ankle uh, equinus correction. We have to do the uh, silver scale test to ex exclude tight gastrocnemias. If it is uh, not involving gastrocnemia, we can go for at least lengthening. And 
equinovirus that is due to tibialis posterior spasticity we had to split the tibialis posterior and transfer those to the peroneus brevis and equinovalgus is a spasticity due to peroneus muscle then upper limb target is to non ambulate patient our target is to get the hygiene procedures to get hygiene procedures done if the ambulatory patient we have to get the functional procedures to day to day activities so that is a, that's also again we can start with orthoses and um, injections for the muscle relaxation for the spas spastic muscles then later we go for a surgery so sometimes uh, there's a one study is they some study shows uh, upper limb surgery they give more cosmetic outcome rather than functional outcome that is again is debatable how extend that will the upper limb surgeries will improve their functional life compared to uh, cosmetic is cosmetic is more prominent in limb improve rather than functional outcome so again it's uh, debatable but at your stage you need to know if it is non ambulatory you think about the hygiene procedure to patient can wash their mouth wash their uh, poor side everything with the patient can do by his own so that is the target is a non ambulatory patient if is ambulatory patient we can target is to improve his further functional ability thank you very much one thing i i think i need to explain about this uh, one thing i forgot i think i'll get back sorry about that this coach gate coaching gate this idiopathic course this idiopathic that if you do uh, uh, yes i mentioned here spastic crouch contraction may be iatrogenically precipitated by lengthening of the axillary tendon now imagine patient is coming with the spasticity of the hamstring and we do the surgery axillary tendon and get the dorsiflexion but it's a, they can't ex, fully extend knees because of the spasticity of the hamstring so if you do the surgery and axillary tendon lengthening procedure that goes to the spastic crouch can get because of as the um, atrogenic cause so that is also one mcq point i i wanted to mention specifically but i forgot to mention it there so it's important that it's a one important it, it could be question in your wife table i think that's the main area you need to know under cerebral palsy if you know that text and it should be more than enough probably it, it, definitely it won't be a long case as far as my knowledge it could be a short or intermediate case but it's probably a lot of questions would ask in the mcq paper and would be a a viable table as especially in the pediatric table so that's all it is thank you very much thank you ajit for yet another brilliant presentation from your side really focus for the frcs yes uh, just a few questions uh, yeah. before we conclude the session uh, do you think uh we need to use a gait lab and look at the gait before you really go in for a semls procedure that is single event multilateral surgery because in case like you mentioned if you do a release and the patient actually gets downgraded so that is something you do a i mean like you addressed about core spasticity issues yeah, yeah so do you yeah. think a gait lab is a must before we really do any kind of release definitely yes i would i think yes it's a must we have to do the thorough examination and thorough assessment even the gait also what i recommend go for a qualitative and quantitative assessment you know is a quantitative assessment we have to have a kinetic kind kinematics and uh, uh, all assessment we have to do and the qualitative only we assess the stages of the disease so then we can each muscle we can assess sometimes we can do the eng studies is for the qualitative uh, eng analysis for the quantitative assessment that is very important because then we can understand which which component is exactly important and to get the functional because we are going for a single you know it's called shark attack it should be a multi level it's a shark attack so we can't address it it is a partially address that will not get the desired outcome so i agree with you we have to do the proper thorough assessment every aspect okay i think ajit uh, that's all the questions that we have for this session because you have covered inside out 
of cerebral palsy with respect to the FRCs. Of course, there are a lot of things to go into detail. For example, okay, before we conclude, just one last question. Uh, what is the current relevance of doing a, an adductor release combined with an obturated neurectomy? Because that was a very common procedure in the past. Yeah. It's a preventive procedure to avoid hip subluxation. Uh, actually, Hitesh, I'm not that aware of this obtu uh, obturator <clears throat> and this adductor release, so I need to, follow because we had to look for the okay, evidence. Yeah, it was a very common procedure in the past that you, yes. I mean, to avoid hip subluxation, you do an early adductor release along with an obturator neurectomy. And its uh, importance is gradually fading down of late. Yeah, okay. yeah, I because I'm not that question. familiar with that obturator neurectomy because I don't know, so... That's, yes. that's I need to read about it. Yeah, first. exactly. So that was a very popular procedure in the past, but uh, like you said, it's gradually wearing off and it's yeah, yeah. Getting less popular nowadays. Okay, thank you, Ajit, for joining in. Fantastic okay. presentation as usual. I mean, you've done a lot of lectures and they've all reached to a lot of people all over the world. Thank you so much for joining in. No problem. It's a pleasure. <laughs>